Over the course of these last several weeks, we've been looking specifically at the family of Jesus. Um, a couple weeks ago, we looked at the genealogy of Jesus. We looked at the ancestors of Jesus, and we saw how Jesus had some shady characters in his ancestry, some very questionable men and women who were listed in his resume, if you will. Last week, Shannon did a phenomenal job of bringing us into the life of Mary and helping us see from a first-person perspective of how Mary, uh, Mary's life and all that she had to go through in bearing birth to the Messiah. And yet, there is another character in the story of Jesus that we often neglect and we very rarely focus on. Um, if you've been with us for a while, you remember that every year we would have a nativity scene up here, um, and it would be it would have the manger and have um, Mary and the shepherds and baby Jesus and um, the wise men and Joseph and all of those were set up right smack on the middle of the stage. Unfortunately, this past year, a few of the wise men and their shepherds lost their heads and their hands when the box fell over and toppled over, and somehow baby Jesus is also missing. And so, um, so we and I totally forgot to order a new nativity scene, but. Back in the day when all of King Jesus' birthday character figures were all in one piece and there was no need of putting them back together again, um, we would put baby Jesus in his manger. We would put Mary next to him. You could tell who the wise men were because they wore robes or they had crowns. Um, And then you had these other characters. And you couldn't really tell who these other characters were. We knew they were either shepherds or one of them was Joseph. But we didn't know which one was Joseph. We couldn't figure out which one he was. And so I would let my kids just say, hey, pick Joseph, put him near Mary, and that would be um, who Joseph was that year. We had no idea who he was. In reality, Joseph is the forgotten man of Christmas. He's silent. Surprisingly, the most influential male figure in the life of Jesus never utters a word in Scripture. He's like an extra a minor character that's listed on the credits in, at the end of a movie, but he never says a word. No one ever considers him central. No one ever considers him significant. No one ever considers him to be of value to the story of Christmas. He says nothing. He's silent, and yet he's obedient. And that's the most significant thing you will discover about Joseph is his obedience. He is remarkably simple in his obedience, but he's also simply remarkable in what he is willing to do in hanging everything on the line in immediate obedience on a word from God which on the surface level seems to be absolutely absurd. Joseph is remarkably simple and yet simply remarkable. There are a lot of us who simply lack the resolve to genuinely follow Jesus. We love to. We want to pursue him with all of our hearts and say we'll do whatever he calls us to do. But to really go all in requires a motivation beyond what you and I have. We say we would love to do everything, right? We want to be disciplined Um, in our faith. We want to be disciplined in doing the disciplines of our faith like reading scripture and praying and regularly attending service and doing the things that God's called us to do. But what we want and what we do often contradict each other. I think I've been surrounded by these kind of folks all my life. They follow Jesus when it's easy. We, When we're part of a group of friends who are all doing it, who's pushing each other, we want to do it. When it naturally within our lifestyle we do it but we lack the energy to do it when it's hard to do it when there's no one else around to stand alone to swim upstream to keep going where there's nobody standing behind them saying keep going keep pushing when when there's no one else to encourage them that's when they stutter that's when the engines fail that's when they die along the side of the street to actually follow Jesus is difficult And that's the great irony of the Christian life. Following Jesus ushers you into a life that is simultaneously the most joyful thing that you could ever experience, and yet the most difficult decision you can ever make. Jesus would say in John 10 that he came to give us life, and life abundantly. 
In Psalm 16, it says that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. In Psalm 84, it says that better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. But Jesus then, on the flip side, makes a statement in Matthew 16 that if you want to follow me, you're going to have to take up a cross and follow me. I don't know what kind of image that gives to you, but in the ancient world, it wasn't a pleasant one at all. Today, we wear crosses out of diamonds and golds around our necks as pieces of jewelry. Back then, it was a symbol of oppression, a symbol of torture, a symbol of death. That caused horror to people that saw it. In those days, normal, nice people didn't get a cross tattooed on their bodies. Imagine you went over to somebody's house today and over their kitchen table was a picture of an electric chair and you walk into their family room and there's a picture of a firing squad you don't stay for dinner and you never bring your kids over there for a play date ever that's the imagery paul says in first corinthians 15 that if the resurrection is not true then the followers of jesus ought to be the most pitied in the world because our lives are characterized by the cross See, for Paul and the other apostles and the early church, following Jesus meant suffering. Following Jesus meant sacrifice. Following Jesus meant persecution. Following Jesus often meant death. It meant living with questions in your life unanswered, dying in many ways as a loser, as a nobody in that time, in that culture. And Paul says that if I get to the end of my life and it's all a hoax, it's all a scam, I'm not going to say, oh, well, it was still a great abundant life. At least I enjoyed life. He's going to say, no, if all of this was a delusion, then I'm the most pathetic person in the entire world. To actually go all the way with Jesus, you've got to have a strong grasp of why he's worth pursuing. You've got to understand why Jesus is worth pursuing. This is what we see in Matthew 1. Matthew shows you right from the beginning, right out of the gate, how difficult it is to follow Jesus and how Jesus' first followers, who happened, by the way, weren't the disciples, was this young teenage girl named Mary and her fiancé, Joseph, how his first followers found the motivation to do so. Look with me at Matthew 1, 18. We're going to go down to verse 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, he was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. All right, let's talk about this whole betrothal process. In the old Jewish custom, it was an old Jewish custom, a young man and his fiance would get legally married. They'd have all the benefits of marriage, but they had to wait a year before they could live together or sleep together. Had to be the dumbest tradition ever invented, right? Um, And so one of the reasons was to make sure that the girl was pure. When you chose your wife for your son, you paid this huge price for the bride's family. And any the the parents paying the price wanted to make sure that the girl was pure. And so they required a year of waiting so they, before you could live with her or sleep with her to make sure she wasn't pre-pregnated or whatever, right? Um, and so after that year was clear, then you could live together and be intimate. But in every other way, during this season, you were considered married. To get out of it, you had to get an official divorce. Well, during this period, Mary sh- shows up to pregnant. Can you imagine for a minute how painful, how humiliating this was for Joseph? What would it have been like for Joseph to hear from the girl that you just married, but you haven't been allowed to sleep with yet, that she's pregnant? And Joseph, of course, doesn't believe her. He's like, yeah, right, the Holy Spirit got you pregnant, and he probably gave you like a pet unicorn as well, right? Um, He just, he doesn't believe her. But Joseph was, for whatever it was worth, a good guy. And he was kind, and so he arranged to break the marriage quietly. You know, legally, he could have had Mary stoned. She would have been dead, legally. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. You ever wonder why did God do it this way? I mean, this action ruined both of their lives, ruined both of their reputations. The angel doesn't show up and explain the situation to everyone else. He doesn't send out a news bulletin. He doesn't send eight other angels down to promote, pronounce to the entire world that this is what's going on. Everyone else from this point on thought of Mary as an impure girl. When they look through the yearbook pictures years later, they look at Mary and say, oh, she's the one that was scandalous. She was the one that everyone is embarrassed of. As far as we know, there was never any clarification or vindica vindication until the New Testament was written 30 to 40 years after this time. And at that point, it was kind of irrelevant. And when Joseph married her, it seemed like he was confessing that the baby was actually his. The pregnancy ruined both of their reputations in their community. Mary didn't get the storybook wedding she always dreamed about with her dad walking her down the aisle and all of her friends and family being present. I know for many of you women, your, many of you women, your wedding is the most highly anticipated, most expensive, most planned for day in your life. Just because Mary lived 2,000 years ago, don't assume that she was vastly different. Her dreams of her own beautiful wedding days were shattered. Ruined, not by an angry mother-in-law, but by Jesus himself. Not only that, they would actually have to flee from their homeland because of Jesus. Why did God do that? See, I think the Holy Spirit is laying out this pattern from the birth of Jesus for how people will have to follow him. Let me give you four elements, four things from Joseph's life about following Jesus, and then show you where Joseph got the strength to follow him. Joseph is not just an inspiring figure from the past, but he's a compelling example for us in the present. What does following Jesus look like? Four things. Number one, trust and absolute obedience. Trust and absolute obedience. Joseph had to believe the impossible and to risk everything on it. Listen, you don't do that if, just because Jesus is your preference or just because you like Jesus. You do that because you believe that he was your savior, that he rose from the dead. Let me make this personal. A lot of you made sacrifices to go all in for the kingdom of God. You've lost friends when you pursued Jesus. You had to make tough choices that weren't easy. A lot of you make tough choices financially, huge sacrifices financially to invest in what God is doing here in the local church and in global missions. The only reason you're doing that is because you believe Jesus was raised from the dead, that his promises are true, that his kingdom is eternal. And in fact, if you struggle being sacrificial, let me tell you why. It's because you lack the confidence in the promises of an unseen God. People who lack confidence in God's promises will throw some guilt money into the offering plate, but they'll never give in a sustained sacrificial way. Following Jesus, really following Jesus, not just playing religious games, means absolute trust in an unseen God, trust and obedience. Secondly, it means acceptance of a sentence of death. Mary's out-of-wedlock out of pregnancy put her into a literal death sentence in Jewish law. Beyond that, Mary and Joseph had to die to a good name. Their cherished dreams, their families, and their homelands for a season. For some of you guys, in 2017, God told you to do some things. Make moves, make decisions. It made no sense to you. It made no sense to your loved ones. It made no sense to your family. But you were obedient to Jesus. And as you look into 2018, there are some of you in this room that God is going to call to radically trust and obey him. And people will not understand it. They will tell you you're crazy. They will, might even forbid you. And you're going to have to choose, do I obey God or do I please man? And it's going to feel like that. John Bunyan is a man who wrote Pilgrim's Progress while in prison. 
spending many years in prison for preaching the gospel in his own country. And he wrote these words. He said, the parting with my wife and poor children have often been to me in this place as a pulling of flesh from my bones. I have often brought to my mind the many hardships, the miseries, and the wants that my poor family has to meet with, especially my poor blind child who lay nearer my heart than all I had besides. If ever I would suffer rightly, I must first pass a sentence of death upon everything that can properly be called a thing of this life, even to reckon myself, my wife, my children, my health, my enjoyment, all of that as dead to me and myself as dead to them. Following Jesus means acceptance of a sentence of death. Number three, self-denial. Verse 25 tells us Joseph didn't know Mary or have sex with her until after the birth of Jesus. Not only did he have to wait a year during that betrothal process, but now he has to wait another year. That's significant. Following Jesus means denying yourself some things you might otherwise enjoy. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to consent to do things his way, even if it means denying yourself some things you might otherwise enjoy. Self-denial. Number four, willingness to embrace inconvenience. Do you realize how much the birth of Jesus' life complicated Joseph's life? Messed up his relationships with his family. Messed up his relationships with his friends. He had to change his jobs, move to another city. Eventually had to start completely over. Serving Jesus is rarely convenient. Pursuing Jesus with all your life is rarely convenient. Many of you don't volunteer here on a week-in, week-out basis because it's convenient. You do it because you love and value and treasure Jesus. And you love and value and treasure the church. The people, you folks that are serving your community, that are loving your neighbors, inviting them into your home, don't do it because it's convenient, but because you're committed to Jesus. Sharing Jesus with people is rarely convenient, whether that's reaching out to a neighbor or striking up a conversation with a coworker, whatever it is, it's rarely convenient. It takes risk. If you're going to, if we're going to racially diversify this church, it's going to be, it's not going to be convenient. Getting to know people who are not like you and don't share your background takes intentionality. We're going to have worship music up here that might not be your favorite, but it's someone else's favorite, and you put up with it because you're willing to embrace inconvenience because you love and you follow Jesus. If the defining characteristic of what you're looking for in a church is convenience, can I pray? I pray that this wouldn't be the church for you. To become the people of God that God wants us to take, take God wants us to be takes willingness to embrace inconvenience for the sake of mission. Four things you see in the life of Joseph. Trust and absolute obedience. Acceptance of a sentence of death. Self-denial. Willingness to embrace inconvenience. And where does Joseph get that strength from to do these things? Where does Joseph find the ability to do this? Joseph doesn't have an emotional moment of surrender. This was the beginning of a lifestyle of, four, of those four things. And this is really important if you and I are ever going to make it. Where does Joseph get the strength from? First of all, you have to see that word behold in verse 23. Behold. In the Greek, it's an extremely strong word. It's like saying, look at this, pay attention. It's like you taking your kids and grabbing them and saying, listen, you need to get this. Because when you see this, when you see what I'm trying to tell you, you have the strength to do what God is asking you to do. What is he telling them to look at? Behold. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means that God is with us. Two things where Joseph gets his strength from. Number one, a promise that is kept. A promise that is kept. This is a quote given in Isaiah chapter 7. And it's actually kind of a strange quote, so let me unpack it for you real quick. Originally, this was given to King Ahaz in Judah in about 700 BC when the armies of Syria were about to attack and destroy the kingdom of Israel. And well, because 
Ahaz was so wicked and he knew it, he didn't feel like he could ask God for help. And so he despaired. And word came through the prophet Isaiah, however, that God was not going to allow the kingdom to be destroyed because God wanted to keep his promise to Abraham. And Isaiah tells Ahaz that God is going to give him a sign of it. Well, unbelievably, Ahaz didn't want a word from God because then he'd be obligated to do it. And so he says, no, don't give me a sign. And Isaiah says, you don't get to make the rules. Here's your sign. God is going to accomplish his purposes whether you want him to do it or not. And Isaiah says in Isaiah 7, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now that word virgin in Hebrew can mean one of two things. It can mean a girl that's never had sex before, or it could mean a girl of a marriageable age, a young girl. And in this, con in this context, everyone assumed that it meant just a girl of marriageable age. And they would have been like, a young woman will conceive, big deal. Young women conceive all the time. That's like saying the proof of this prophecy is that the birds will chirp and the dogs will bark, and it happened. Someone in Ahab's household had a baby, and that was a sign. And that didn't seem quite impressive to the people. And for 700 years, this prophecy was kind of a mystery. In Scripture, it seemed like it was just out of place, didn't fit in. But now, through the angel, God says, this is actually what I was talking about. It's not just that a young woman will conceive, but a virgin, the other meaning of the word. A girl who's never been with a man will conceive. Now listen, that's a little bit more impressive. And in that incredible birth, I will deliver Israel from all of their fears. And I will fulfill the promises that I've made to Abraham. Ahaz was thinking about deliverance from an invading army. God was promising ultimate deliverance from all enemies. And in that moment, Joseph saw that God was faithful to keep to the fullest all of the promises that God has made. The times looked dark. It looked like Israel had been run over by her enemies, but God took an obscure prophecy in the Old Testament and brought ultimate fulfillment through it. Here's what you and I should see from that. That God kept all of his promises back then. He'll keep his promises now. He will keep his promises to you now. A lot of us ask, is God really active in the world? How could what is going on in the world be anything but random? If God is really involved, why is it all such a mess? Or maybe you're asking about your own life. God, where are you in my life? God, are you really out there? Are you really active? Here's the sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. And not just that, that the virgin's baby grew up and lived a life that you and I couldn't live, died on the cross, he was placed in a grave, but he didn't stay in the grave, he rose from the dead. Some of you in this room, you doubt God's existence on the fact that he hasn't done anything you've wanted or everything you've wanted. Listen, if you asked my children to build a case that I exist based on the fact that I always do what they wanted, the case would be pretty weak. I don't always do what they want because I know better than they do. Your trust in God should not be based on how well he has fulfilled your expectations. But based on the signs that he has left for you, behold, a virgin has conceived. By the way, could I say this in absolute humility? Joseph was able to have this kind of faith because he knew the word of God. Many of us, we waver in our faith because you don't really know the word of God. The strength of your faith cannot exceed the knowledge of your promises of God. Number one, a promise that is kept. Number two, a remarkable name. In this passage in Matthew 1, the baby is given two names. He's given Jesus in one, pass, in one verse and then Emmanuel in the second. And that's always confused me as a kid. Right? Well, what is his name? Is his name Jesus or is his name Emmanuel? What is one in his actual name? Is the other one his nickname? What's your name? Jesus. My last name is Christ, but you, my friends call me Emmanuel, right? But you, you and I, you can call me Lord, right? Um, and so 
But they're both his names. The first name, Jesus indicates what he does. The second, Emmanuel, indicates who he is. Jesus in the Hebrew means God saves. Emmanuel means God is with us. Jesus, what he does. Emmanuel, who he is. Jesus, God saves. Emmanuel, God is with us. And in those two names, Joseph gets a picture of the glory of God. The most foundational doctrine of Christianity was that God was, uh, Jesus was 100% man and 100% God, born of a human Mary, so he was fully man, but he was virgin born, but that she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, so he was fully God. He was born as a man because he had to be man so that he could be our true representative on the cross. He lived the life that we were supposed to live. He had to face everything that we face, and he passed every test that you and I ever failed. And he died on the cross that we were condemned to die on. He took our place on the cross as our representative, and only he could do that because he was fully man. And yet he also had to be God for two reasons. Because in the Old Testament, the only one capable to save like this was God. The message of the Old Testament was salvation belongs to God. God doesn't contract out salvation to some lesser being. And this is where the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses are dead wrong here. God had to do salvation. God had to save. And secondly, the whole point in God's creation of us was to have a relationship with us. God had to do this. All the way back in Genesis in the Garden of Eden, God walks with Adam and Eve by night, and Adam and Eve could say, God walks with us. When God led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, he did so by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud by night, and the children of Israel would say, the Lord is before us and the Lord is behind us. God is with us. And then God builds them a tabernacle where his glory came to dwell among them, and the children of Israel would say, God is in the midst of us. Jesus is born, and the angels would say, call him Emmanuel, God is with us. And when Jesus left and the Holy Spirit comes on the first disciples and into your life and my life, we say, God is in us. You weren't created to serve a distant God who watches over you like a judge. You were created to love a father and walk with him like a friend. Do you know God that way? Do you know God that way? Listen, seeing God as Jesus and Emmanuel gave Joseph the strength to follow Jesus. Listen, there's a secret is that everything that God is asking Joseph and Mary to do, he himself was willing to do in a much greater sense for them. Like Joseph and Mary, Jesus would be misunderstood. He would be falsely accused. Like Joseph and Mary, the religious establishment and the community would despise and reject and condemn Jesus. Like Joseph and Mary, Jesus would carry about in his body a death sentence from being falsely accused, except he would actually die in shame, bearing the curse for someone else. And like Joseph, Jesus would have to deny himself, self-denial. He would take up his own cross, and open up his hands to have his nails driven in his hands so that you and I can be saved. He took our sin. He bore our shame. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Essentially, Joseph is being invited to share in the suffering of Jesus. Everything that Jesus experience on earth you have you have to be willing to experience if you are a follower of Jesus and the only way you will find the strength to do that is to see that Jesus did it for you and now you can do it with him you know the great commission at the end of Matthew's gospel Matthew 28 begins with these words behold I am with you I'm with you Matthew the writer of the gospel of Matthew bookends his book by beginning with God is with us and he closes with God is with us he reminds us Emmanuel God 
is with us. You have to see what Joseph saw. The promise and the name silenced the voices of doubt in Joseph's spirit. The dark voices that were there telling him, you cannot do this. And those two things silenced the doubts in your life. You know, the story of Jesus is filled with shady characters. Your story might be filled with all sorts of stuff. And the only thing that can give you the power to forsake it is to see the joy and treasure of pursuing Jesus is worth more than the pain of sacrifice. And the way that you see it is to see that he gave it up for you. He was God coming in the flesh to save you, enduring unbelievable pain and shame to rescue you. See God as Jesus, the God who saves. See God as Emmanuel, the God who is with you. If you lack the motivation to follow Jesus, to go all the way, good news. You don't need the strength to resolve. You, don't need, you just need to deepen your joy in what Jesus has done for you. When your joy in him is strong, so will, so will be your ability to forsake everything else. You know, we don't know much more about Joseph in the story. This is the last time he appears in the Gospel of Matthew. And by the time Jesus is an adult, Joseph is no longer in the picture at all, which means he most likely died. But he passes on a legacy for how we can gain the strength to follow Jesus. One last question and I close. What would have happened if Joseph had not chosen this route? What would have happened if Joseph chose the easy route? That he didn't believe the angels. That he divorces Mary, casts her aside, he marries a different girl. What would have happened? He would have gotten the storybook wedding that he wanted. He would have had a nice little carpentry business. But Joseph would have missed out on Jesus. What happens in your life and my life when we choose the easy route? When we try to make life as convenient as possible? When we choose not to forgive when we know the Holy Spirit is telling us to forgive. When we choose not to sacrifice when, we, when the Holy Spirit is telling us to sacrifice. When we choose to withdraw when the Holy Spirit is calling us to engage. What happens when we choose the easy route? And I challenge you to say, when you do that, you miss out on Jesus. In those moments when God tells you to stretch yourself to do what is uncomfortable, when God tells you to deny yourself and you don't, for the sake of your own convenience, what you actually do is you miss out on the things that Jesus wants for your life. Maybe this morning you're in a difficult situation right now and you're wondering where God is and if he's forsaken you or is through with you. But listen, God has a plan in it and you'll only experience God's best if you will do it God's way. If you would just trust God with it. See, the story of Joseph's life, the man who never speaks, who never utters a word, but all we see is him being obedient. The story of his life is it's worth pursuing Jesus. That God keeps his promises, that Jesus is worth the pain, that Jesus is worth the shame, that Jesus is worth the shattered dreams, that Jesus is worth even death if it comes. It's worth it. It's worth it. Can I invite you, as you close this year and you're looking to 2018, can I invite you to make a resolution that you will pursue Jesus no matter what? And that your resolution won't be that you will do more things for Jesus. Your resolution is that you would truly treasure and savor and love and enjoy the presence of Jesus. Because when you do that, all the doing happens naturally. I invite you to spend time with him. Meditate on him. Don't let the story of Christmas just be another story that you hear year in and year out. Don't let the story of Easter and the cross be another story that you hear week in and week out. Let it bring you joy. To know that you were loved when you didn't deserve to be loved. To know that someone else took your place, to know that Jesus died for you. May that bring you so much joy, so
so much excitement that it will cause you to say, God, whatever you're calling me to do, I'll do it for you. Jesus went all in for us. He went all in. And what he calls us to to is to endure for him what he's endured for us. He's endured it to a much greater extent for us than we will ever have to endure it for him. And yet he calls us to trust and obey when it makes no sense. He calls us to give of ourselves in absolute obedience, but he calls us to do all of this as we savor and treasure and worship 